and verse 25 and the first verse of the fourth chapter we read these words anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong and there is no favoritism masters provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you will also have a master in heaven I think these verses set for our mind some of the things that happened to the church during the next period of history that we want to talk about and help us to appreciate the thinking that was in the minds of men at that particular time. It's obvious that by the time the 1840s rolled around that not only were there going to be problems in the church over the question of organizationalism but there was going to be problems in the Lord's church over the question of how to deal with the subject of slavery. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 we're told how God created man and gave him rule over all his creatures at the time that he created him. But man was excluded from ruling over those created in the image of God. Now God instructed Adam, he said, of all the creatures that he created, he was given Adam dominion. He said, I'm going to give you dominion over the fowls of the air and over the fish of the sea and over all the living creatures of the earth including the creeping things that crawl upon the earth. But it's obvious that God did not surrender his rule over those he had created in his own image. For we find him giving instructions to them as to how they should live and what they should do. And therefore God intended that he be the ruler of the earth. Now we would not have time to expand upon that and show you from the scriptures that the Bible over and over again speaks of the sovereignty of God. But it is a true uh, axiom of Scripture that God is sovereign over man. Only when men rebelled against the authority of their Creator and overthrew the Creator-subject relationship that they had with God, did man find himself subject subjugated to his fellow man. Almost didn't get that word out of there. It almost seems sometimes to get up here, I'll, I have to get things rolling a little bit before everything comes out the way it ought to. <laughs> Only when men rebel against the authority of God, his creator, and overthrew that creator-subject relationship that God had established in the beginning, did he find himself subjugated to his fellow man. Slavery is the result of sin. John verse eight, chapter 8 and verse 34 says, Everyone who commits sin is the slave to sin. And wherever slavery exists, it is because sin ha is existing and sin exists. As sin multiplied, so did slavery multiply. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 4, we read these words. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards, when the sons of God went into the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. Now this is an interesting word. We have it several times in the scriptures, but in this particular verse, he talks about those who are heroes of old, and some translations, of course, say mighty men. But as you begin to research the concept of the Hebrew word here, you'll get the idea that these men were really oppressors of their fellow men. And of course, this led to, to a, a very bad situation when God finally destroyed the world because these men who had uh, 
Uh, when you come to, to Genesis 6, you find that there are two distinct seed lines existing in the world. Those who were seeking to follow God and be faithful to them, the descendants of Seth, and on the other hand, you find the descendants of, of, um, of Cain who were not that way. They were not following and serving God. And these men became oppressors of their fellow men. In Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8, we read that Cush was the father of Nimrod, who grew to be a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, that is why it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now this is another interesting passage of scripture when you find out what he hunted. <laughs> we call a fellow who gets his gun and goes out after squirrel or rabbit or coon or whatever it might be, we call that fellow a Nimrod. If he's a good shot and uh, brings back a fair amount of game. But that was not the kind of game that this fellow was interested in, though uh, such are his namesake today. You look in the original and you find that this man was a mighty hunter against the Lord. That his idea was to draw men under his authority or under his power. And in doing this, he began to centralize man under his authority, establishing a number of cities or centers of his kingdom in Babylon, Eric, Akkad, Kalneth, in the land of Shinar. God had given commandment to mankind to scatter abroad over the face of the earth to Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, to be scattered abroad over the face of the earth, multiply and replenish the earth. But this man did not feel that, uh, that he could follow God's direction. He decided that he wanted to be the director. And so he began gathering men under his authority and really determined his here that he was a mighty uh, enslaver of men or oppressor of men under his power and authority. In fact, the kingdoms of this world have their beginning in the seed line of Nimrod. The ancient kingdom of Babylon, Eric, Akkad, Kalmath, all centers out of which the Babylonian uh, empire eventually came. Human authority had usurped the authority of God, and when that took place, because of man's rejection of God and sin against God, he found himself subjugated to his fellow man. Sin and slavery have existed in every age and continue to exist until one is set free by Jesus Christ. We read in John chapter 8 and verse 36, If therefore the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Only then is man truly free. We might talk about free man and slave man in a context of the political environment of this country uh, a century ago. But in reality, even those who claim to be free have been enslaved by sin. Because the Bible says so. It says whenever a man uh, commits sin, he becomes a slave to sin. In John chapter 8 and verse 32, Jesus said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Man is, get, gains his freedom through truth. We know that at this time, beginning in the 1840s, of course, and even earlier, this country became severely sectionally divided over the question of slavery and the existence of slavery. In order to gain somewhat of an understanding of that, let's just look back through the history a little bit and see what actually took place. The slavery of the black man under the English-speaking people began in England around the year 1562. About a hundred years later, a little bit more, in 1672, the Royal African Company was formed, and the grand old Duke of York was made its head. 
we sent a report of this act. I can't remember what it was to use throughout it, but I, I remember that it was to, to the old song that the Boy Scouts used to sing, the Grand Old Duke of York. Uh, had 10,000 men, he marched them up the hill, he marched them down again. And when they were up, they were up, and when they were down, they were down, and when they were only halfway up, they were neither up nor down. We used to sit around and sing that thing, uh, jingle, but this was a man. Of course, it referred to a battle that he'd had as a, as a military leader of England, but he was a man who was the head of the first actual slave company, which was a, a governmental sponsored thing in the British Empire. This gave way, of course, about 20 years later in the year 1697 to private traders. And the government was no longer in that business. It was a matter of private trade. And in, here in America, when the first settlers came to this country, many of those early settlers landed in New England. The Pilgrims and the Puritans came to New England and to the Massachusetts Bay Colony and were Calvinistic in their theology. I don't know of any theology that has done more harm to the cause of Christ than the concept of Calvinism. I say that in all kindness for the man who, uh, who came up with these ideas, but yet it was the idea of the New England Calvinists that God had elected them to eternal salvation. And if they were God's elect, they came to this country with the idea of doing what they could not do in England. They were part of a separatist movement from the Church of England because they were trying to reform the religious system that was involved within the state of England. And yet, believing in Calvinism, they believed it was their destiny to show that really the state ought to be, or the church ought to be the state. Instead of the state controlling the church, in reality, the elect of God ought to control everything as God's people. They were destined to that matter, and therefore when they came to the United States, they came with the idea, since we can't, we can't bring about this reform in England and show them what true government under God ought to be, then we'll do it here in, in Massachusetts, and once we have it completed and show them how good government under God can be, then we'll go back to England and say, Here's, here it is. Here's what government under God is really like. And that was their idea. They believed, therefore, that God had given the heathen nations to them as their inheritance. After all, they were God's elect. And when they came to America, they believed in, in uh, a manifold destiny that they were destined here by God. God had led them to this land very much like he had led Israel to the promised land. And therefore, we the heathen were their inheritance. Not only did they carry this out in their conduct towards the Indians, but this became the, the expediency when it came to the enslavement of the Negro. They really thought we're only coming into our rightful inheritance. And beginning in 1697 and continuing through the year 1730, there developed the slave trade, first of all, in New England. Well, we could call it the slave and rum trade, but that's what it really was. And good Calvinistic Congregationalists in New England and good Calvinistic Baptist people in Rhode Island thought that there was surely nothing wrong with manufacturing a little rum and sending that over to Africa and trading it for human life. And they did that. In fact, by the year 1730, Rhode Island was sending about 18 vessels a year to Africa, loaded with a minimum of 1,800 hogsheads of rum. They got the rum in Jamaica, and the West Indies brought it up to New England, distilled it, and according to some ship owners, watered it down. <laughs> so that they'd have more and would be able to bring back more slaves. And that's the way that was conducted. Slaves were found throughout New England by the time of the Revolutionary War, 
with Massachusetts leading the way with 6,000 slaves uh, in the state of Massachusetts, the state in which I live today. What was the great awakening that took place in those uh, middle 1700s that we talked about under Jonathan Edwards and other leaders in New England? There came about a modification of Calvinistic thinking and a more humanistic attitude or more human attitude towards human beings. In fact, Samuel Hopkins, a congregational preacher in Newport, Rhode Island, in the year 1769 became very disturbed when he watched these slave uh, ships uh, coming into the port of that city. And seeing the condition, the, the terrible condition of these uh, African Negroes who were being transported across, across the ocean, so much so that he got up in his pulpit and told these upstanding Calvinist people who were responsible for this uh, thing that uh, this was an evil in the eyes of God and it had to come to, to an end. Well, you can understand that he wouldn't have been very popular because this was a part of their economy and uh, a part of the wealth of those who were got, uh, engaged in the trade. But nevertheless, he not only preached it, but he printed pamphlets and distributed it throughout the city and gained a, uh, a considerable influence over his congregation. And then we find about this period of time, especially among the Quakers, uh, a very active uh, part was played by these people in freeing slaves and in bringing opposition to bear, not only in New England, but in Pennsylvania. And further south, the Quakers at their annual meetings uh, made resolutions concerning the fact of, that they were against the concept of slavery and that all slaves among the Quakers should be freed if they were to remain in the fellowship of the Quaker religion. By the time this feeling among the Quakers reached South Carolina or North Carolina, the southern states began to pass laws which made it very difficult for a man to free his slaves. The laws were passed uh, that a man would have to, uh, a slave would have to show uh, great material service in some way to be able to be free. And this, of course, was to stop the erosion uh, of uh, slaves uh, by granting them freedom. But by the end of the Revolutionary War, that is, in 1781, the New England states had abolished slavery. There are three, really three distinct periods in the history of the anti-slavery movement in the United States. The first of these periods was an early effort made at abolition, of which we have talked about uh, here in the, uh, at the, about the time of the Revolutionary War. There's probably two reasons which led to the opposition of slavery. We mentioned one was the Great Awakening and the religious revival and a hum humanitarian spirit that developed among the people, a modification of the Calvinistic thinking and more concern for individual people and individual rights. In fact, we can see this being written into the, to the concepts and thoughts that influenced the Revolutionary War. In fact, this is the second reason, probably for this early attempt at abolition. Such phrases as, all men are created equal, were the things that brought about the Revolutionary War. Not only did they say, all men are created equal, but they also said, life, every man has a right to life, to liberty, and to the pursuit of happiness. They also said, all men by nature, are free and independent. It was these principles that finally persuaded the Americans to go to war with the British to gain the freedom of which they felt they were being enslaved by uh, England itself. The first anti-slavery society was organized in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and was known simply as the Philadelphia Society. It was organized in the year 1775, at the very beginning of the Revolutionary War, and Benjamin Franklin, that is the kite flyer, was appointed president 
of this first anti-slavery society. And by the year 1787, shortly after America had really uh, been born as a nation and the war had ceased, all states north of Delaware and Maryland provided either for immediate or for gradual abolition of slavery. Laws were passed even by the southern states that forbade the importation of any new slaves into the country. Churches became very active in both anti-slavery uh, efforts and in an attempt to convert the Negroes uh, to uh, Christianity, the religious persuasion, and most southern churches of that day, just as we saw the slide of the Brush Run Church of Kentucky, provided uh, for slaves to be members of their congregation and uh, were so listed along with the other members of the congregation. This period, however, was marked with a great deal of talk and very little action. Even in the South, where, uh, where slaves uh, were a part of the economic development of the South, uh, yet many Southern people, while maintaining slavery, at the same time were willing to uh, pass a resolution for abolition, saying that's the right thing to do, we ought to do it, and sometime we will. But it really didn't bring about any concrete action at that particular time. And so, right after the beginning of the 1800s, that early period of anti-slavery abolition movement kind of slowed down and eventually died out. In the year 1816, a, another concept came about in the thinking of men, and this was that the freed slaves, which there were many at this particular time, ought to be transported back to Africa and recolonized in their native land. And so this was the next concept, is the colonization of the Africans in their native land. We have to recognize some of the things that were going on at this particular time. Between 1816 and the year 1830, the Southern Revolution in agriculture had taken place. As we mentioned in a previous message, the cotton gin had been invented in the year 1792, and tobacco ceased to be the major economic crop of the South. It gave way to King Cotton. In, four, in a four-year period between 1791 and 1795, five million pounds of cotton were grown in the United States, the majority of it, of course, below the Mason-Dixon line, or all of it, probably. In comparison, we take a four-year period between 1826 to the year 1830, there were 307 million pounds of cotton grown in that four-year period. The value of the slave in 1790 was about $300. By 1830, the price had gone up to $1,200, and by 1860, a slave was sold on the market for $2,000. You can see from this not only the growth of cotton in the economy of the nation, for by the year 1860, the value of ex the exports of cotton represented 50% of all the exports of the United States of America. You can see the, the value of that economically to the nation. And secondly, you can see the value that they placed upon slave labor in order to reach the cotton and export it and uh, gain the the uh, financial stability uh, of the country. The first colonization ever took place in the country of Liberia. And uh, slaves were actually uh, their masters many times who had freed them, actually paid for their transportation back to Africa. They, they just felt that that would be the best solution that could possibly be worked out uh, at that particular time. And then after the year 1830, we enter into the third phase of the anti-slavery movement. And that was a radical phase of abolitionism. By radical, we mean that they went, they went to extremes 
to proclaim the concept of abolition. We have to understand a little bit about the times that were going on at the time and what was really happening. It was a time of great national expansion, as we have seen. The Louisiana Purchase had opened up a vast new territory for the United States. The state of Texas had become an independent nation and was about to uh, apply for uh, admission into the Union. And there was a great deal of, of a, still a concept of manifest destiny among the people. And this is a, a word that was coined by a Washington newspaper reporter. And yet, manifest destiny represented the religious thinking of the country primarily. It meant that God had blessed them. They had become an independent nation. God was evidently with them. They were expanding and becoming a, a, becoming a great and an important country in the world as far as wealth and power was concerned. And so as that expansion moved westward, there were those who wanted to continue that expansion because they felt that God had willed it. Uh, therefore, they were interested in not only the territory that was controlled by the United States of America at that time, but they were interested in territory uh, within what we know as the bounds of the United States today that was actually controlled by Britain and also by Mexico. Uh, they were interested in obtaining some of that and even expanding the country to a greater extent. And there really wasn't a whole lot being done at this particular time concerning slavery until the year 1831 when Nat Turner led a slave rebellion in Virginia that just kind of shook everybody up. And again, men began to realize the great evils that slavery had wrought within the nation. About this particular time, too, we have not only an economic expansion of the country, but we have a transportation revolution and a westward uh, uh, that combined with the westward expansion. Canals began to be dug in 1830. Uh, the day that the railroad, the first railroad was launched in Baltimore, Maryland, the first canal began to be dug from Washington, D.C. Uh, to Cumberland, Maryland what was called the Sea and Old Canal. Uh, I've hiked much of the towpath of that canal uh, in recent years, and that was intended not only to go to Cumberland, the Queen City, as it was called, or the West, but it was also to extend across the Allegheny Mountains to Pittsburgh. That was the dream. How were they going to get a canal dug and get the canal boats transported across those mountains? Well, they designed pulley rigs to lift the boats up the side of the mountain on, on uh, cars and rails and place them down over the other side and then back to the waters again. And if they could make Pittsburgh, then it would be the Ohio River and into the Mississippi, you see. It was, a, it was an era when transportation was looked at as being very important. But they had their difficulties in getting that canal dug from Washington, D.C. to Cumberland, Maryland, in fact, the B&O Railroad. The first railroad in the United States beat the canal to Cumberland, Maryland. And the canal never was a very successful economic enterprise, though it continued to exist and was used up until the year 1924, mainly for the hauling and transporting of coal uh, down the canal. I preached seven years in Pawpaw, West Virginia, which uh, has the only tunnel on that canal, almost a mile long, an engineering feat that was completed in the year 1865. A tremendous endeavor. The engineer was a Methodist preacher, but uh, most of the people who worked on it, of course, were immigrants. Uh, so the railroads were launched, and this led, of course, again to the idea of expansionism and the need for the country, and this brought a considerable amount of uni unity in the country, but it also brought division. Eighteen thirty-four, eighteen forty-three. I slipped the cog somewhere here. I can't remember. I didn't put it in my notes. 
But the Mexican War was a, a divisive thing as far as this country was concerned. Most of the New England merchants did not want the Mexican War, uh, and uh, uh, it meant an embargo for them, uh, but others were in favor, especially those who were in favor of expansionism to the West. And so, of course, the war was fought, but it bitterly divided many people uh, in the country over the need for the war. And of course, one of the, one of the things that was in the minds of many people was the fact that if the Mexican War expanded the number of Western states, that uh, there were many who desired these states to remain free, but they knew that it, it was expanding in the Southwest, and therefore it would mean possibly new slave states. And there were many people that, of course, were against that. Many things were weighed one against the other. And uh, to give you a kind of a view of what was taking place at this particular time, we'd like to just read a few comments. Um, about this particular time, a new political party came into existence known as the Free Soil Society uh, Party. The Free Soil Party was, was simply a party which was saying any new state should be free states. They should not be slave states. This had a, a, a tenacious connection with the Liberty Party, a group organized by the abolitionists that had put up national candidates in the year 1840 and again in 1844, but had managed to obtain only a few thousand votes. The Free Soil Party was more than an expansion of the Liberty Party. It called for the exclusion of slavery from newly acquired territory rather than, than for its abolition. Martin Van Buren was its presidential candidate, a choice which typified the nature of the party. He had been unsympathetic to the forces that opposed slavery, but disillusioned with the Democrats because of their advocacy of manifest destiny. He was now willing to lead those who were dissatisfied with both the major parties into a revolution against them. The key issues dividing the party was, of course, slavery in the new territory. This is the Democratic Party. President Taylor, who proved to be more of a leader than the Whigs had expected, set about to resolve the difficulty. And then he talks about this, and then he talks about Henry Clay. After Taylor's death, with presidential leadership removed, Henry, Henry Clay, who had presented a plan to Congress six months before Taylor died, now looked, took command of Congress. But Clay's plan could carry only with bipartisan support. Clay rejected the principle of territorial referendum on slavery and insisted, and instead tried to lump together a number of controversial issues and resolve them all in one piece of legislation. Clay called for the mission of California as a free state. You know that was in the year 1849. Federal uh, assumption of the debts of the old Texas Republic a stiffening of the fugitive slave laws, the erection of Utah and New Mexican territories, and the abolition of the slave market in the District of Columbia. By having all these issues together, each senator would be forced to vote for a bill that included some provisions that may not have been very popular in his home state. As a result, Clay could not muster enough support for his measure. Then Stephen Douglas, a young Democratic senator from Illinois, by convincing Clay to divide his proposals into individual bills, managed to be, by adroit maneuvering, to get each measure passed to the Congress. This was called the Compromise of 1850. And of course, this led, uh, once again, to many people resenting uh, that compromise simply because it did stiffen the fugitive slave laws, and even in the free states, uh, a man, a uh, sheriff, might be allowed to go into that state and bring back a runaway slave uh, in any federal territory uh, and return him to his master. And then, following that, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, uh, which was another kind of compromise legislation because uh, Douglas and others were trying to get the railroads built through uh, their state and on to the west. Uh, for economic purposes, and uh, that bill kind of threw Nebraska in the free state category and Kansas into the slave state category. Along came a woman by the name of Harriet Beecher Stowe who wrote a book entitled Un Uncle Tom's Cabin. But it was not completely abolitionist or anti-slavery per se, but it pictured some of the suffering 
of the slaves in relationship to the splitting up and dividing of families and the hardship. And she made people realize as they read that book that these people were human beings just like they. In 1857, then, we had the famous, by a Democratic-dominated Supreme Court, Red Scott decision, which took away the constitutional right of the Negro. And, of course, we know the story as it follows in 1859, John Brown's raid in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, and his lynching uh, there, a town that's just a few miles from the town where I was born uh, in West Virginia. The churches were pretty much divided between the moderates concerning the issue of abolition and the radicals in both the North and the South. Actually, there was many in the, in the North who did not uh, conceive of the direct abolition of slavery at that particular time. Well, now, what about the church? What about the Lord's church? What attitude did God's people take towards these things? In the year 1830, Martin W. Stone released his own slaves, granting them freedom, and as you'll realize that this is right near the period uh, of the uh, divi dividing line between the second period, the colonization concept, and absolute ab uh, abolition of slavery in the United States. Stone was a man who favored, at that particular time, the colonization actually paid the passage of his freed slaves back to Africa. He felt that this was a wise, and a workable solution. Alexander Campbell had, it, had two slaves, young boys, when he first began preaching in the concept of reformation and the restoring of the New Testament church. He recognized the evils of slavery and determined to free, bo free both of these young men. He had inherited two older slaves from his father-in-law, John Brown, when he was given the, plan, uh, the farm, the mansion, and the farm, uh, as we have related uh, on a previous, uh, in a previous lesson. But he determined that he would not release these two young men until they had been educated and were capable of taking care of themselves in society. And so he kept them at his own expense until they were 27 years of age feeling only then were they really capable of going out into society and making their own way. But it shows his attitude. David Perviance, one of the leaders in the Stone Movement, became a uh, political figure in the state of Kentucky. Entering into the Kentucky legislature in the year 1797 and continuing there to 1803. Well, during that time, he worked within the state of Kentucky for a general and gradual emancipation of the slaves of the state. And when he found that favor was turning against this concept, in the year 1809, he removed to Ohio uh, because of the attitude of the rest of the legislature. He just could not go along with it. And uh, he said, well, I'll go someplace else where so people have a, a more respect uh, for human life. Thomas Camel. As you remember, the father of Alexander Campbell in the year 1819 had gone to Kentucky. Uh, he had left Brush Run. The, the idea was to move the whole Brush Run church to Steubenville, Ohio. And having been there for a while, uh, he went to Kentucky and opened up an academy and began teaching uh, slaves to read and write. And someone came along and told him one day, that's against the law in Kentucky. You're not allowed to teach a slave to read or write. And that so aggravated his spirit that he just simply packed his bags and told his family, we're moving. <laughs> and he went back to Pennsylvania. <clears throat> this shows some of the early concepts that were present among Bull's pioneer leaders of the Reformation movement. Negro slavery preceded the disciples of Christ in Kentucky by several decades. When the full impact of the Restoration Movement struck Kentucky in the, year 18, uh, in the 1820s and 1830s, like a back 
Baptist plague, it simply gulped down slavery along with every other social problem in that exuberant and youthful society to be digested later when there was time. They simply they were so busy converting people to Christ and trying to bring people to a New Testament position of things that it says they just, that was one of the issues that just wasn't handled sufficiently uh, during that particular early period of time. In the 11th Annual Report of the American Foreign Anti-Slavery Society in the year 1851, it was noted that the Campbellites owned 101,000 slaves. According to this report, they were only exceeded by the Baptists and the Methodists. This would mean, according to recent historians, that the disciples on a per capita basis were the leading slaveholding religious body in the United States. Now, of course, you have to understand that the progress of that Reformation took place very much so in those border states. Uh, and at this time, of course, there, there wasn't the concept of free uh, and slave states. Uh, tobacco was an important crop in, in Kentucky and in Tennessee. Uh, and uh, slaves were freely used, of course, in ag agricultural pursuits. Then we come to the middle period, beginning in about the... This time, Alexander Campbell, who had never yielded to pressure to become a politician, accepted the responsibility of being a delegate to the Virginia Constitutional Convention in the year 1830. He went there and he had a proposal in mind to make for that Constitutional Convention. It was a convention to rewrite the Constitution for the state of Virginia in the year 1830. But he knew, in going to that Constitutional Convention, that slavery would be one of the key issues. And so he proposed, or was going to propose, a law which would use the surplus in the state treasury of Virginia to colonize, uh, to free and colonize the slaves in Africa and reimburse the slave owners for their economic loss. They had a surplus in the treasury. He said, why not use it for this? <laughs> but by, when he presented this to a few of the men who were likewise delegates to that convention, they said that the abolitionists, um, the, the feeling against the anti-slavery movement was so strong at that particular time uh, that there would no, not be any possibility of passing such an act and therefore to... Uh, it would be better to withhold that because it would only give impetus uh, to those who were pro-slavery within the state of Virginia. And so the proposal was never made, and that was the last exploration that Alexander Campbell made into politics. Stone, uh, as we mentioned, was likewise a strong advocate at this particular time of the colonization plan. By the year 1840, the church as a whole, was pretty well divided on the issue of slavery into four classifications. First of all, we had those who were for absolute abolitionism and an active role by Christians in bringing that about, to enter the political arena and gain abolition for the Negro. In Ohio, there were two men who were leaders in this effort, Cyrus McNeely and Matthew S. Platt. They centered around the Hiram College uh, in the uh, northeastern Ohio at the time, near Cleveland. In Indiana, a man by the name of Ovid Butler became a leader in the abolitionists. And in Kansas, a very colorful fellow by the name of Pardee Butler. I don't know the relationship between him and Ovid, but both were very active in the abolitionists societies of the day. By the year 1850, a school was founded in Indiana at Indianapolis known as the Northwestern University, or Northwestern Christian University, rather. This school became a hotbed for abolitionism among the churches of Christ in the United States. Ovid Butler financed 
the establishment of this college. And along with the school, they began printing a magazine known as the Northwestern Christian Magazine, and John Boggs became the editor. He was opposed immediately by Alexander Camel, not only from the standpoint that he felt the magazine was not needed, as there was uh, sufficient papers already in existence, but because they were taking such a rabid political position with regard to, to the issue of slavery. And so Camel had and uh, put out a number of, of articles in the Millennial Harbinger, and there became quite a bit of animosity between those who were centered around the Northwestern Christian Magazine in Indiana and Alexander Camel. Fermenting within the movement, in 1856, there was a riot on the campus of Bethany College, led by three men, a man by the name of A.B. Way, Harvey W. Everest, and Philip Burns, a man who had recently come from Scotland. All of these were students in the school, and it was a protest effort upon the part of the students uh, in favor of abolitionism. But it died out. The fellows who were involved in that thing were dismissed from the school, and immediately were accepted, almost immediately at least, some of them, uh, the leaders of the movement, in the Northwestern Christian University in Indianapolis. The year 1855, Hardy Butler, a preacher and a strong advocate of abolitionism, decided to go to Kansas in the heat of things and see what he could do uh, to overthrow slavery. And uh, of course, Kansas during this particular period of time from 1855 to 1860 uh, earned its title Bleeding Kansas. And I'd like to read you something uh, about this man uh, as a sidelight here. It said Butler was one of the troop of two ideated preachers who went to the territory of Kansas in the year 1855 to keep the devil out of the young churches and to keep the slaveholders out of the young territory. The turbulent territory deservedly earned the title Bleeding Kansas in five riotous years between 1855 and 60, and Party Butler was a catalytic part of the ferment. Butler's son reminisced that in those days it took a man with sand in his crawl to come to Kansas and stay. Hardy Butler not only went to Kansas to stay, but shortly after his arrival bought a farm in Atchison County, the center of the southern strength of the territory. Butler soon began relentlessly to attack the slave element in the territory from the pulpits of the scattered Christian churches by writing voluptuously in the free soil papers of the territory and by sending occasional reports to the New York Tribune. The outspoken preacher quickly became a marked man in his home county and on scores of occasions his life was threatened by the southern border ruffians who roamed Atchison County. He was warned not to enter the town of Atchison, but not to be intimidated by threats he boldly walked into the southern stronghold on several occasions. Once he was mobbed, once he was tarred and feathered, and because there wasn't any feathers available, they used cotton seed. Uh, and on another visit to town, he had the new, unique experience of being rafted. And this meant they got a hold of him, and they put him on a, on a raft and set him adrift uh, in the Mississippi River. <laughs> uh, and they put a big sign on the raft, marking in large print an R standing for the fact that he was a root, and commissioned his tiny vessel with a colorful pennant that read, Greeley to the rescue, I have a nigger, the Reverend Mr. Butler, agent for the Underground Railroad. <laughs> and they simply cut him loose and set him afloat. Outwardly unperturbed by this harrowing experience, Butler, as he recalled the incident, admonished his antagonist as they towed him away from the bank of the river. Gentlemen, if I am drowned, I forgive you. But I have this to say to you. If you're not ashamed of your part in this transaction, I'm not ashamed of mine. <laughs> Goodbye. <clears throat> because there were many at that particular time involved in the political concepts of the anti-slavery movement in the abolition societies, there was a strong feeling around Northwestern Christian University 
let the Missionary Society, which had begun in 1849, ought to offer some type of resolution to the churches condemning slavery and advocating the maintaining of the Union. And when this did not come about, they actually organized a Christian Missionary Society in the year 1859 in competition with the American Christian Missionary Society. Ovid Butler was elected president of this new missionary society. It was only dissolved after the American Christian Missionary Society in the year 1863 passed a stringent loyalty resolution. And then they simply dissolved their organization, went back in. But what this is showing is that for four, between four and five years, there was a definite division so strongly felt over the issues of slavery and what was happening in the country at that particular time that they were ready to cast themselves into an entirely different mold. And they did. On the other hand, there were those who were among the churches definitely pro-slavery. Probably the most famous among these was a man by the name of James Shannon, a very educated, highly educated man who came to this country. He was an Irishman. Not all Irishmen uh, have tempers and are colorful individuals, but I guess this fellow fit the, uh, fit the bill. He began as a teacher in a college in Alabama, and within just a, a year or two became the president of the College of Louisiana. From here he became the president of Bacon College in Haroldsburg, Kentucky, the first school that was organized among the churches. And from there he went to the University of Missouri in 1851 at Columbia, Missouri, because he was uh, interested in what was going on in Missouri and trying to maintain the slavery uh, position. And because of his political views, uh, he did not last but about four years at the University of Missouri when a new Christian school was opened up in Canton, Missouri, named Christian University. But he was very active in Missouri in politics at this particular time, making speeches throughout the state in favor of slavery. Um, and if we had time, we'd read uh, uh, a, a portion of the speech that he gave. But I think that's sufficient. Here we have two sides presented a third side which represented the majority of the movement actually took a moderate position. Alexander Campbell published some articles between the year 1840 and 1845 in which he stated our position on slavery. And I would like to share something along those lines with you that you might understand uh, what was in the thinking of this man. <clears throat> We, are, we know his feelings, his personal feelings, and we've already related, but he says this, whether clearly and definitely stated or not, in what has already appeared, that is previously in the Molino Harbinger, our position, however it may be regarded or sustained, is based on three propositions, rather indeed on three well-established facts. That is, one, Roman slavery, certainly no better than American slavery, prevailed in all countries in which those churches existed to which the apostolic epistles were addressed, and in which the relationship of master and servant is at all alluded to. Two, in the primitive church there were masters and slaves, while they were yet under the personal inspection and guidance of the apostles themselves. Free from a particular and full induction of every passage in the New Testament that alludes to the relationship of master and slave, or to the relative duties of master and slave, there is not any indication of the unlawfulness of the relation, but simply a recognition of it with a very clear and specific directions to the parties how they should conduct themselves to each other in the discharge of their duties. To him it was a matter of a political situation in which the church was simply present in a political world. It was, uh, its hands were tied as far as the overthrow of a political system was concerned. They simply had to live and live a Christian life within the system. 
And to this Alexander Campbell appealed, the scriptures contain just too much for him to become an abolitionist uh, and to become actively involved uh, in the, the political situation. And so he simply pled uh, with men for a moderate position. He felt that slavery, as we said, was not a political, uh, was a political issue and not a religious one. That Christians should do their very best in relationship to every human being. Other modern leaders of the period were Tobert Fanning in Tennessee, Benjamin Franklin in Ohio, not the type flyer, John R. Howard of Missouri, John T. Wash of North Carolina, and Walter Scott. And Walter Scott, though very pro-unionist in his thinking, uh, was a man who felt silence was the answer. The majority took this moderate position because, first of all, some of the thinking of these brethren with regard to the church and its progress conceived of social reform as a long and gradual procedure. You can see this in Alexander Campbell's thinking when he entitled his new paper in 1830, The Millennial Harbinger. Remembering the quotation that we read concerning that, he says, we have begun something that is going to continue for a thousand years. It was that thought that they had in mind and that eventually slavery in this country would be overcome if Christians simply patiently did uh, uh, responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Secondly, there was a natural version to preaching politics and to keep politics out of the church, separation of church and state. Therefore, Christians should not be concerned with politics. They ought to be concerned with the kingdom of God. And thirdly, there was that biblical literalism that had been instilled in their minds since the beginning of the movement. And they just could not overlook the fact that the New Testament contained the book of Philemon. There, therefore, their position was a fairly moderate one throughout the struggle. But the question comes, was the division real? I have felt from the beginning of my study of Restoration history that here was one of the very crucial issues that faced the church and eventually led to the division of the church. Though almost every historian that I have read of the Restoration Movement has said, and proudly, that the church was the only religious body in the United States that did not divide over the subject of slavery and the Civil War. Um, this was their statement. And they could prove that by the fact that all denominations had divided north and south pretty well. And this is where you get Northern Methodist, Southern Methodist, Northern Baptist, Southern Baptist, uh, Presbyterian Church North, Presbyterian Church South. Episcopalian Church North, Episcopalian Church, well, pretty much so. But there wasn't a real stringent division there, at least not on that ground. But I have always considered that a misstatement. It was only until very recently I found a historian that really felt the same way. And I'd like to, to uh, conclude here with some thoughts from his writing. Almost unanimously, disciples historians have taken considerable pride in the truism that the Christian church did not divide during this critical period. Robert Richardson, the father of disciple Sister Graffery, wrote in 1868, Mr. Campbell's conservative course in regard to this disturbing question, while it preserved the reforming churches from division, excited against him the animosity of many individuals. Winfred E. Garrison, the very able dean of the modern disciples historians, wrote of Camel's